Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Dental Implants for the General Dentist, sponsored by Elsevier, Elsevier Clinic Review Articles. This presentation, recording, and slides will be made available to attendees on October 2nd. You will have the opportunity to pose questions to our presenter at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time for questions, we will respond to all unanswered questions via email. Please be sure to tell us what you think at the end of this webinar by providing feedback on our short evaluation, which will appear on your screen after our event concludes. Our presentation today promises to be engaging and informative. Today's presenter is Harry Dim, DDS, Chair of Dentistry and Oral Surgery at the Brooklyn Hospital Center. Dr. Dim is a Brooklyn native with substantial experience performing complex procedures ranging from dental implants and wisdom teeth extraction to management of facial and jaw pathologies and treatment of complex facial trauma. He is a clinical professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery at Columbia University College of Dental Medicine, a member of the American Dental Association, a fellow of the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons, and a member of the New York State Society of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. Dr. Dim is a board certified oral and maxillofacial surgeon who is a well-known educator and author in the oral surgery field. As a reminder, I'd like to note that this presentation, recording, and slides will be made available to attendees on October 2nd. Without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Dim. Welcome, Dr. Dim. Well, good morning, uh, Jessica, and uh, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Mr. John Vassallo, editor of the Elsevier series on oral and maxillofacial surgery and general dentistry as well. It's a great privilege and honor, in fact, to be part of the inaugural webinar series on behalf of Elsevier and the clinics. And I think uh, this will be the harbinger of uh, future webinars that will prove hopefully equally successful. Uh, this morning's topic uh, is rather bold in its in its uh, and broad, but in scope, but I think it's something that uh, we can get through within 50 minutes to an hour. Hopefully, uh, the people listening will leave with a little bit more knowledge and some clinical pearls that they can put into immediate use. The topic is the dental implants for the general dentist. I believe very strongly in general dentists doing implants and performing complex procedures and I am passionate about that. In fact, um, have in my years past always instructed general dentists in this area. So today's discussion will be in three segments. The first part will be on site preservation, preparing the alveolus for the placement of future implants following extractions. Two sinus lift procedures when the posterior maxilla is planned for implants and there's a vertical challenge to the implant placement, how to approach it and how to do that. And three, of course, uh, a topic that's become very much timely and being performed much more than ever before, the immediate placement of implants. This is a, uh, a photo taken recently. I am, in fact, the chairman of the Brooklyn Hospital Center's Department of Dentistry and Oral Surgery. We have 21 residents currently, both in oral surgery and in general dentistry. And aptly named, I am standing in front of the Harry and Frieda Dim Dental Center, which is a state-of-the-art facility here in the wonderful borough of Brooklyn. A lot of what I have to, do, have to say today is linked, in fact, to a recent book that I was uh, very privileged to edit called Implant Procedures for the General Dentist that came out this year, April 2015. So a lot of the material is, in fact, within this textbook, and it's much more expansive in the book. So if there are any questions or if more information is required, I think this is an excellent book to reference for those interested in expanding their implant practice. Let me just start uh, by saying that I have received no compensation from any commercial vendor that, whose products are going to be mentioned. Um, I will be mentioning some products because I use them. 
and this is very much a talk about how I do things, what I found um, that works in my hand, but it doesn't exclude or preclude any other material out there. I'd like to thank my residents uh, listed in the slide for having assisted me in the preparation and for particularly my chief resident, Dustin Bowler, who is very computer savvy and has helped me with this webinar as well. Well, let's go immediately to site preservation. Why should we be concerned with site preservation? What exactly is site pres preservation? And is it something that I should be routinely doing? And the answer is yes to all three. Site preservation simply means maintaining the alveolus so that it does not undergo any resorption, both in the horizontal and vertical fashion, to allow it to be a solid, stable, bony foundation for the placement of implants. Because literature has shown that given time, there will be a significant transition from, as you see in the slide, from the pre-surgical extraction site, number one, going to number five, where there is, over time, a gradual diminution of bone, both in the vertical and horizontal fashion. This happens. It's a biological reality and will happen even if the jaw is not loaded by a denture or some device. The greatest change will, in fact, occur within the first three to six months. So why graft extraction sites? Well, clearly, you'd like to put an implant into diagram C because implants that are stable do well. The number one cause for implant failure, the number one cause for implant problems is lack of initial implant stability at the time of placement, and that can only get worse going forward. So one wishes to have a solid, bony foundation to place implants, and that's why site preservation has really become important. Now, for those who think, well, if I'm not placing an implant, I'm doing a three-unit bridge, does it really make a difference? Well, it does for that basic dentistry as well, because when you lose vertical height of bone, the gum follows with it, the gingiva follows the contours, and you're going to have a aesthetic and biologically difficult area to clean when placing a three-unit bridge, and you're going to have some periodontal problems developing if, you, in fact, you have shrinkage around the gingival vertical height. So even if you were not to place implants, and that was not in the treatment plan, three-unit bridges or any bridges coming over the site will benefit from site preservation as well. These are just some examples of what happens when you don't graft. And you can clearly see you lose vertical height and you lose significant horizontal width. Now, what happens if you don't graft and then you suddenly, with the patient, decide, well, let's put some implants there anyway? Well, here's an example of a case I did this past month that was horizontally challenged in the aesthetic maxillary anterior zone, and we were left with a challenge. How do we increase the horizontal volume to allow for implant stability? And this is just an example of showing me doing a ridge splinting procedure, which we won't be discussing today, which is a more advanced procedure and something that I think we'd like to avoid by doing site preservation. This is another case I did where we had to use can cortical cancellous block grafts to obtain that horizontal width. Again, a much bigger procedure, one we would wish to avoid by doing site preservation. So is there evidence that, in fact, site preservation is indicated. Evidence-based medicine and dentistry, of course, is what we should be practicing. And in fact, there is significant amount of literature. And of course, I tell everyone listening, and as I tell my residents all the time, you should be doing a lot of research, looking at the literature. Everything is now Googleable. And I think this is something that has been shown well in the literature. This is out of an article of the Clinical Oral Implant Research that the average loss of bone is with four millimeters and 
horizontal width, and up to a millimeter and a half within six months following tooth extraction. So well, basically, when you take a tooth out, of course, we're all familiar with routine extractions. It fills in with blood. The blood that gets then there undergoes a revascularization process. Connective tissue is laid down, which then becomes mineralized, and then ultimately this epithelialization, and this is a long process. So grafting, I think we've established, and it's, it's a, a well-foregone conclusion that grafting and site preservation is important for both implants as well as for the three-unit bridge. But now the question is, what material should I place within that socket? Now, this has been well studied, and over the years, there's been significant transitions from the first implant I placed, 1987. Basically, graft material all contain three components to the graft material that are inherent in the graft material. A graft material can be osteogenetic. That means it can, in fact, contain osteoblastic cells within the graft material, which will then undergo osteogenesis. Obviously, this can only be done if, if you take active cells from the patient's own uh, skeleton, and that would be referred to as autogenous bone, which still, to this day, of course, is the gold standard. It's the best graft, but with autogenous bone, harvesting comes significant problems. It's a different surgical site, added pain, added possible site for infection, added bleeding, etc. The other materials that are available most commonly are allografts. Allografts are bone from the same species, from a cadaver. And these grafts are able to act as a scaffold for the ingrowth of vascular tissue, and they help quickly ossify a socket, and that's referred to as osteoconduction, the ability for a graft to act as a scaffold and be conducive for the body to lay down bone. This would include allografts. This would include xenografts, which are grafts from a different species. The most common species that we use is bovine bone. And the other material would be synthetic bone, like resorbable hydroxyapatite or tricalcium beta sulfate. And of course, there is a new product which induces the body to form osteoblasts, and that would be bone morphogenic protein, which is a growth factor that your body produces. And two companies have been able to synthesize that. The product is very expensive, but it is available, and I, in fact, have used it multiple times. What do I like to use for site preservations? Well, again, I prefer to use allografts or xenografts. Why is that? Because they, the bone comes in, in a bottle, you take it out of the bottle, and then you place it within the socket. I use Mineros, which is a BioHorizons product. Sometimes I use Aloos, which is a, a surgical bone. Sometimes I'll use Puros, which is a Zimmer product. It really does not make a difference, though the companies will each claim that their product is unique. Most of these mineralized or demineralized bones go through the same sterilization process. You could buy them in different particulate size. Some people, I prefer to buy smaller particulate sizes so that they, they're more actively resorbed. You can buy them as a cancellous product or a cortical cancellous. When I'm doing socket grafting, I use cancellous bone. This is a xenograft that I use. You could use the Biomet or the Geislich product. There are different companies that sell it as well. Uh, this is bovine bone and bone from cattle. And quite frankly, a lot of my patients prefer to use this when I give them the alternative, and I think you should. Some patients do not want to use cadaveric bone, even though there has been never been a reported case of transmissibility of any HIV or viral diseases within the confines of the, of the United States. Um, nevertheless, there are some patients who just prefer not to have that. So this is an excellent product. Bovine bone has been studied repeatedly throughout the past three decades. Great literature. And there's some literature to actually suggest that bovine bone or, and, or 
bioos may be in fact equal to autogenous bone. Again, this has been studied uh, on xenografts have been studied for years. This is a paper studied that studied the use of xenografts in 2008, the Journal of Periodontology, and that found it to be an excellent source for site preservation and with great results. There's another paper uh, that looked at different products. This and asked the question, well, there's there is there a clinical difference in the in the outcome in the implant stability if I used, for instance, a synthetic bone like calcium sulfate, or if I used hydroxyapatite, or if I used cortical cancellous bone, is the outcome any different? And and this was an interesting study, again out of the Journal of Periodontology in two thousand and nine. Well done study which showed that there was no clinical difference whether you used any of those products. So I think the uh, the take home point is um, you use what you're comfortable with, what you feel suits your purposes. Uh, the, the literature is clear that allografts work well, xenografts work well for site preservation. Of course, autogenous bone works well. This is just an example of how it's done. You do a the extraction is performed, and of course, you wish to do an atraumatic extraction, obviously, because you want to maintain the buccal plate and the labial and the labial buccal plate or the palatal plate, and you just want to deal with a socket defect. You don't want to be in a situation of having to reconstruct one of the buccal or palatal plates. You take the bone. What I do with the bone is if it comes out of a bottle, whether it's a be a xenograft or allograft, I like to pick some of the patient's blood and soak it in that. It gives it a little consistency. It makes it stick together, easier to use. Or you can use some sterile saline, but you want to get that little stickiness so that it doesn't blow around the patient's mouth when you place it. And you just carry it into the socket. There are different ways. There are certain companies will sell you a almost like an amalgam carrier type device. Most people use just tuberculin syringes to pick it up, and then they use the little barrel plunger to compress the bone. How tight should you compress it? Well, that's interesting. Over the years, it went from compress it significantly to don't compress it too much because you want to leave some area for growth of vascularization and angiogenesis, and that's where we are now. Now, in the old days, meaning 25 years ago, we would always think about primary closure. You must close over the bone for it to work. And then we realized, and this is the work out of Tony Sklar down in Miami, that it would work well even if you were not going to do primary closure. He likes to use a collagen plug as a cap, Oh, but I will tell you the literature has shown that it, you needn't only use a collagen plug to cap it. You can actually use gel foam. You could use other things. Collar plug works well, and that's been a technique that I've usually done. So you can see the, the collagen plug that's been secured with sutures. It keeps the particulate bone nicely secured in place. It takes a few days for this to resorb, and ultimately you have a very well-healed, nicely epithelialized alveolus ready for implant placement. Uh, just a few words on atraumatic extraction. I think that's the most important part of the case. It's uh, the most important part of placing implants is starting with a solid foundation. And, that, and, and if you are, in fact, the general dentist who is going to be watching and progressing this case forward, I think it's an opportunity for you to, to really get good and concentrate on the extraction. This happens to be a power tome procedure, and uh, I actually wrote a chapter on, on atraumatic extractions that one can find in the clinics of, uh, of North America, the dental clinics of North America, and this is a powered periotome. It's an excellent device, and it, there is a learning curve like any technique, but it is a wonderful tool that I use to do atraumatic extractions. Now, what happens if you don't have a an atraumatic extraction. What happens, in fact, if you've lost some buccal plate of bone? Do you have to now go to a plan B, or can you still do site preservation? Now, this is the work out of that Tony Scalar, and he has a very good textbook on on soft tissue grafting and soft and hard tissue grafting for implant surgery. And 
if your buckle plate defect is less than a third of the socket, then one need not worry, and you can place a membrane, a resorbable membrane, and then use your particulate bone of your choice. However, if you really have a, a very large defect, now that is something that would not work and would not be amenable to routine site preservation. And now that would, in fact, require some more sophisticated work, whether you use a onlay graft or whether you choose to use particulate, but you would have to go with primary closure and perhaps even use BMP or titanium mesh. But that's not today's discussion. But this is the defect that we did talk about. If you use up to a third of the bone, you take a biodegradable bio or resorbable collagen membrane. Do not use Gore-Tex, something that is not resorbable. And this is, again, available through through multiple companies, Zimmer, Ace, BioHorizons, Geisler. There's so many who sell membranes. I like to use an extended membrane, meaning that it takes at least 6 to 12 weeks to resorb, and then you go about your business, place your graph, and go forward. And this is just an example of the membrane in place with the grafted socket. Now the question is, how long do you wait? between placement of your particular bone to placing an implant. Again, like anything in, in, in uh, science, there's different there are different feelings based upon what material that you use. If you place an allograft three to four months, some people feel that with bovine grafts, it's a slower resorbing material that you should wait five to eight months. I usually wait between 12 and 16 weeks and I've never had a defect uh, with waiting for that period of time. Okay, now we're going to transition over to the art and science of the sinus lift procedure. Now, let me just say that I am a firm believer that that general dentists who have an interest in implants and who've studied uh, the literature and who have taken continuing education courses and have a knowledge of anatomy and complications and technique have no reason to shy away from from sinus lifts. And we'll discuss that as to how I do it and what techniques I think a general dentist can use and incorporate into their office that would be predictable and, in fact, uh, a viable for a general dentist. What the, the major indication, of course, for sinus lifts is the atrophic posterior maxillary vertically height challenged patient. And what is the lateral, what is the classical approach to a sinus lift? And the word sinus lift comes because one makes a lateral window, and this is out of the work done by Dr. Hill Tatum in 1980. And then some of his work was then expounded by Block and Kent, but basically you make a lateral window in the maxilla. You raise that window in a superior fashion. You lift the membrane of the sinus and you place your bone in the in the space that you've just created. And this is a clinical picture showing a window that's made. Now the window could be a single tooth window or a multiple tooth window. Quite frankly, single teeth windows for a first molar is much harder to do than if you're replacing a second premolar, first and second molar. And you're more likely to have complications, specifically perforations of the membrane, when doing a single tooth, when doing more than doing a bigger, larger site, like multiple teeth. Now, do you always have to do a lateral approach to fill bone into a sinus? No. There is a transcrestal approach, also referred to as a transalveal approach, which is an internal approach, and that could be done through the alveolus itself by using a series of dilators or osteotomes. Now, do I do both? Yes, I do both, and that, in, in fact, depends upon how much bone there is present, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes. I have found a technique for doing lateral, the classical lateral maxillary sinus lifts uh, 
using a kit called the DASK system, D-A-S-K. It's a system that, uh, that was produced and invented by Dentium, which is, a, I think, a company out of Europe, and it stands for Dentium Advanced Sinus Kit. Now, I have been doing sinus lifts for since 1990 when Michael Block came to Brooklyn Hospital right after he published his article, so I've been doing it for more than 25 years. I've done many many and certainly teaching that to my residents and I've gone through various techniques diamond round burrs I've used I bought a $25,000 piezo machine which takes forever and then someone introduced me to this about a year ago this is a relatively inexpensive kit about a thousand dollars from Dentium there's a series of rounded diamond studded burrs and what's remarkable is the speed with which this is done the rapidity with which this is done, and if you do it correctly, you do not perforate the membrane. And I really find it to be an excellent system. And I did, in fact, write about this in the 2015 Dental Clinics of North America. It's easily learned, and that's what I pretty much do all the time and teach at the hospital. It comes along with a series of instruments to help lift the membrane once you've made the window. The only problem with the DAS system is it obliterates the bone and there is no superior bone, but that's not an issue. So once you made your lateral window, you then have to fill it with bone. Now, this is a artistic rendering from Geislick, which is a European company which sells bone products and, and membranes. And you can see this is filled the sinus is filled with bone and there's a membrane that's acting as a barrier between the sinus membrane and the bone that you've just placed within the sinus do i use membranes yes i do use biological membranes because even though i have found that you may not see them a tear there may be some microscopic small little tears and that is just an added belt and suspenders to separate your graft from the sinus cavity, which really helps decrease any potential problems with infection. So when do I do a transanthral approach? When do I do a transalveolar approach? If there's four millimeters of bone or less, I do a lateral antrostomy. If there's four to five millimeters of bone, I will do a lateral antrostomy, and I will place my implant at the same time. You need at least four to five to do that. If I have six millimeters of bone or greater, I will do a transalveolar technique. What kind of bone material do I use? Again, it depends on how much bone I need. If I have six millimeters of bone or higher, then I'm, I'm using an allograft material. I may go purely bioos or puros or do a mixture of both. If I'm having a significant, if I have zero bone, which is many a times, then I am looking for autogenous bone. Or for patients who are elderly who I cannot use a different site, I usually use bone morphogenic protein together, mixed together with bioos or an allograss. Again, this is just an artistic rendering showing an implant place. Again, you would like to have at least four millimeters to stabilize that implant. Unstable implant leads to a failure, not only of the bone graft working, but for the implant, of, of course, the viability of the implant. Again, one of the gold standards for doing sinus lift, autogenous grafts is always the gold standard. But I will tell you, and I've looked at the literature, and there's significant literature on what to use, and everyone has used different things for the sinus, and they've all worked. But I will share with you that the one material that has been studied the most, and that's out of Phil Boyne out in California, bioos or bovine bone has been the most studied in sinus, and it seems to work almost as good as autogenous bone. But I will tell you that other materials have been, have been used with success and written about in the literature in retrospective studies. And in fact, there was the work out of Danny Busser's work uh, where he just tented the membrane up. He did not even add any material, and they found that you had bone fill as well. And, of course, there are multiple references, and you could just look this up, and there are multiple articles showing the different materials that can be used to do sinus lifts. How do you place the graft? Again, uh, some of the companies, the BioOS people sell a, and the uh, Geislick sells 
bovine bone product that comes in a syringe with a curved little delivery system. It makes it just really neat, and you're able to just plunge it right in. And then, of course, place the membrane above, even if you don't see any perforation. Prior to doing sinus splits, you really should know your anatomy. You should, you should, in fact, be familiar with sinus disease and the treatment of acute sinusitis, as well as the normal functioning sinus. Not to spend too much time, the sinus is a, a cavity that has a volume of about 15, uh, 15 mL. It drains into the middle meatus, and it's innervated uh, by the second division of the trigeminal nerve. The main artery that passes through it and supplies uh, vascularity to the site is the posterior superior alveolar artery. You may, in fact, um, surprising on occasion, hit that vessel when you're making your window because it travels intraosseously within the bone itself. So if that were to happen, you would see a pretty nice spurt of blood, but trust me, it will respond to pressure and you cannot, in fact, try to tie that because it's just not capable. Pressure will, in fact, tampen on that, and it's really never been a problem in all the years. So basically, uh, you should, in fact, be aware that the sinus can begin sometimes as, as anteriorly to, as to the first bicuspid area, and sometimes it will only start at the first molar or second molar. So you really have to have a good rendering to see where the where the sinus begins. Don't forget, you can only do a sinus lift when you have a sinus. If you miss the sinus by going too inferior, you'll be going through the, the alveolus process and you will not be having a good day. So what's the pretreatment evaluation? Like anything else, before doing any surgery, you should evaluate the patient's medical condition, dental and habit history. By habit history, the, most, the one that I'm most concerned with, of course, is their smoking history. You, there are some absolute contraindications to doing sinus lift, and we'll discuss that in a second. You should have some radiographic studies. Now, what radiographic studies should you have? I think that you should have a good panoramic x-ray is, is adequate. Uh, do I think cone beam studies are better? I do think cone beam studies can give you more information. It is absolutely not the standard of care, and one I would not, in fact, have any problem if anyone chose to do it without. We happen to have a comb beam machine here at the Brooklyn Hospital. We've had one here uh, for years. We were the first to have it in Brooklyn. But, and I do it, use it pretty much all the time, but it, in no way is it something that you must have. It does give you some extra information. What am I looking for? I'm looking for a signs of sinusitis, of course. Uh, that is, in fact, something that you would want to avoid doing in a patient who has active or a history of sinusitis, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You're also looking for septa. Septa are little bony barriers within the sinus, and the reason why that's concerned, because when you have septa, you're more likely to have a perforation. So by knowing that it's there, you are prepared for it and to deal with it accordingly. What are some of the contraindications? Uh, patients who've had radiotherapy to the maxilla um, are, in fact, um, not a suitable candidate. It's it's actually, there is research now that's saying with hyperbaric oxygen, it may, in fact, have gone from the absolute to the, a relative contraindication. Certainly patients who are con uh, poorly controlled diabetics, that's actually a universal contraindication to most elective surgery. Of course, patients with an active neoplasm or, in fact, have inadequate white blood cells, cells and that's certainly a relative con or an absolute contraindication to most surgical procedures, not just sinus lifts. Now, what are some of the relative? Now, active sinusitis. Now, the, most people, especially those living in New York, 30% of the population here has sinus disease, either due to allergies or in fact, to some deviated septum, or in fact, due to bad teeth. Um, you should not be placing implants into people with, with significant sinus disease, with significant mucosal thickening, and they should be treated beforehand. Smoking, should you be placing patients, doing sinus lifts from patients who smoke? Um, patients have a right to smoke and they have a right to surgery, as long as you inform them that the failure rate 
and the complication rate is three times the norm, I think you can go ahead and do that it, uh, as long as the patient has been made aware that they are, in fact, causing themselves significant possible damage. Uh, you should be aware of the complications doing sinus lifts. Um, the most common complication I find sometimes with residents is they fail to measure where the sinus is in an edentulous case because there are no landmarks, and then they wind up starting the, the window anterior to the sinus, and of course, and literally punching a hole through the alveolus to the palatal side. You do this by good radiographic imaging and having a good landmark, and you could use anatomical landmarks. Sinus perforation is the most common complication. Uh, depending upon, there are multiple studies. Um, I'll, be, I'll be discussing one shortly. But anywhere between 20 to 40 percent. If someone were to say to you, well, you shouldn't be doing sinus studies, you're going to deal with perforations. Trust me, uh, oral surgeons get perforations, ENT surgeons get perforations, and peritonists get perforations. It happens, it happens to everyone. Um, and it's something you just need to deal with. And usually, in most cases, it truly is not a problem. Uh, this is an interesting study, studies done on the number or the percentage of perforations. And you could see that there's a series of 10 studies here, and the least was 19.5% in a series of 1,300 augmentations. Nolan et al. That was done most recently in 2014. That was done at Montefiore Hospital, and you can see they had 41% perforations. Now, what do you do when you have a perforation? Well, first of all, there are people who've actually classified the type of perforation based upon the size, and a class one would be a very small perforation that's easily and easily elevated, and that, in fact, when you elevate the sinus, the membrane actually folds over on itself, and you no longer can see the membrane. This is of no concern. You place your usual membrane, and you go forward, not an issue. Of course, there are different classifications. If it's more than 4 millimeters or 5 millimeters, class, we'll call them a class 2. This is an example of a class 2 perforation. Uh, this is not going to close up by itself, but this is easily handled because we've gone beyond the perforation, and you're able to place a membrane here, and this will not, in fact, present much problems. Of course, there are class three, which is a huge perforation, and the question is, should, should you, in fact, be uh, grafting sinuses where you've had almost total loss of all membrane. Has that happened to me? It has on more than one occasion, especially I recall on a patient who was a smoker who absolutely wanted me to do the procedure, and a big-time smoker as well. And what I did for that case, and what I do for cases where there is absolute total destruction of the membrane because the membrane was diseased going in, I have used, and I do recommend using bone morphogenic protein, the infused product, and I've had very good success. So. There are ways, but there are those who would say to abandon if you have that problem. Again, uh, what do you do with a perforated membrane? You should be using some type of resorbable collagen membrane. Again, they come from different companies. They all, they're all they all, to my knowledge, equally good. This happens to be a Geislick product. Zimmer, BioHorizons, ACE, they all sell membranes, and the only point I'd make is that you should use the extended membrane, meaning that it's the one that lasts or resorbs at least three to four months. Now, the question is, what is the correlation between perforation of the sinus membrane and infection or the failure to, to succeed and lack of being able to place the implant? It's interesting. In the Nolan study, that came out last year, and this was published in the Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. It was a retrospective study looking at the correlation between membrane perforations and sinus lift outcomes. They did 359 consecutive augmented sinuses. Now, it's interesting that they're the ones, if you remember, that we just talked about that had 41% perforations. 
And they found that overall, it, in the 41% of, in their 359 cases, there were 6.7% failures in terms of of um, of the sinus lift being successful. But what's interesting is, so they had a 7% failure rate out of 359 sinuses. But of the 7% that failed, they also had included within that 7% failure, 3.4% of that 7%, in fact, occurred in patients who had intact membranes. So to think that only perforated membranes lead to a failure of the bone graft to to in fact consolidate and be of use does not only occur in perforated membranes, it can actually occur in non-perforated membranes. But overall, the success rate was 93%, including the patients who had perforated membranes. So uh, what are the most, uh, what are my usual precautions that I, that I look for? Well, I'm looking for post-surgery. I'm looking for to prevent infection, to prevent bleeding, to prevent my wound opening up, and I instruct the patients not to blow the nose, to use active straws, no smoking, at least for two to three weeks if they can, no bending over, no sneezing with the mouth open. You want to prevent pressure inside that sinus membrane blowing out that graft. I use steroids for all my patients unless there's a medical indication not to use it, and there is almost rare, and I would say your uncontrolled diabetic would be one of them. I use what's called a steroid pack or dose pack. It's, some people use a Medrol dose pack. Some people use a, a Decadron dose pack. It, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, pain medication, of course. I use antibiotics. Which one antibiotic do I use? I use, amox, I use amoxicillin plus clavulanic acid, also known as augmentin. For patients who are penicillin allergic, I'll either use clindamycin or Avalox, which is a second-generation fluoroquinolone. I use 875 milligrams of augmented twice a day, and the clindamycin is 300 milligrams four times a day, and the Avalox is 400 milligrams once a day. I use decongestants. They are now over-the-counter. I have to use Flonase snow spray or Mucinex pills, and that comes over-the-counter. The, the post-operative complications can occur, and, of course, pain is something that you have to assume will happen after surgery, easily managed, not usually that big a deal. Uh, infections are not that common, but you have to be concerned. You have to be concerned because a sinus infection, if not aggressively treated, can progress quickly to a pan sinusitis. So you need to be on top of this. And if you suspect an infection, be ready to drain, be ready to change antibiotics, certainly culture, and, uh, and see that patient quite frequently. Bleeding, I have to tell you, I've never had a bleeding problem of any sort with sinus lifts, but you can get patient may complain of bleeding through their nose, obviously because the sinus communicates with the nose through the middle meatus. Not to worry. Um, bleeding during the procedure, I've never had anything significant. You can have some slight bleeding problems postoperatively. Pressure is, in fact, most helpful. Um, if you overfill the sinus, that can cause and that can lead to a sinus infection. I, I've seen people place, almost obliterate the entire sinus. Don't do that. Um, and just fill the amount that you need for the site that you're, in fact, placing your implants. Chronic sinus sinus can, ha can, in fact, happen. By the way, the biggest indicator for a patient to possibly develop sinusitis is a pre-existing history of sinusitis. So those patients who have a history of sinus disease, I will make sure that their sinus is clean, is clear. I may, in fact, communicate with their ENT surgeon before I do the procedure, uh, and I would be very alert and vigilant to see, in fact, if this patient is going to develop, going on to develop a sinus disease. Oral angiocommunications communications can occur, especially if you're doing a transalveolar approach and that which would require a secondary procedure. And that's a little bit beyond the scope, but not that big a deal. There is a very interesting complication, post-traumatic vertigo, due to some trauma that can occur for those people who use a mallet and chisel when doing the transalveolar approach. And that's something that, in fact, will require a certain maneuver, 
which I usually let my ENT colleagues. I have to tell you, I've never experienced post-surgical vertigo except in one patient when we did a little four, one osteotomy, which is a major orthognathic surgical procedure. Okay, let's talk about immediate implants, which is becoming much, much more common and accepted. Let's talk about when, what, where, why, and how. When should you be doing immediate implants? And well, there are different types of immediate implants. If you place an implant at the at the time of extraction, we call that a type one. If you wish to wait until there's been epithelialization and coverage, socket coverage, then that would be four to eight weeks. And if you wait after until 16 weeks until it's you have a nicely matured ossified socket, that would be considered a type four implant. What are some of the indications for doing immediate implants? Certainly the most common ones are in the aesthetic zone, the maxillary anterior region with a tooth that was fractured or residual roots or teeth that have non-treatable decay. Of course, the contraindications for, the, or for this is actually the same contraindications for placing any implant. If you have actively draining pus from a site, if you have active periapical pathology, if you have gingiva that's grossly edematous, swollen, that would certainly not be a case to do an immediate implant. And of course, patients who have chronic wound healing problems, such as, again, uncontrolled diabetics, etc. The most important critical factor to doing immediate implants is not having implant stability. If you cannot get good implant stability, and your implant is wobbling around, you'd like to have at least over 25 newton centimeters of stability, your implant will be most likely not be successful. The key to good, to a good result in immediate implants is having enough bone to have initial implant stability. Now, this is an interesting paper. And again, I, I, I ask you all, or I recommend that you all go to the literature. Whenever you hear a talk, and of course, in, including today, you should be looking at the literature and seeing what's the evidence based. And even though I, I did say that active periapical pathology, what happens if you see a patient, and we all see patients who come in with teeth with small lytic areas at the end? That's a chronic apical cyst. Is that something you should be concerned about? And this is an interesting paper where out of the journal, the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgical Implants, they reviewed 301 journal articles, and they were the total of 52 implants that were placed within an area that that, not, that was not an acutely infected site, but a chronic apical lesion. And in fact, they had a 96.2% of the immediate implants placed in such bone. But always remember, when you're doing implants with an apical lesion, you need to put a curette into that site. You need to really scrape that bone out. And by the way, when you're doing immediate implants, you really need to scrape the sides of the bone. You need to get the PDL, residual PDL cells, out of the site. So when you're planning immediate implants, like any implant, you need to do a preoperative evaluation. You're looking at the ridge contour. Is there a concavity, which may cause it to hiss once when you place the bone? You're looking at the occlusion. Is that tooth or that area in hyperocclusion, that's certainly not going to be a good thing for an implant, and you should plan on making sure that it is not in hyperocclusion. You're looking at the smile line. Uh, certainly patients who have a high, who have a high smile line and the, the gingival implant interface is seen much more readily, that's a patient you have to be, your antenna needs to go up and you need to make sure that you've discussed a possible gingival recession with that patient. Radiographic imaging, you need to have a good study. You can do this with a two-dimensional study. One does not require a cone beam. Do I do a lot of cone beams? Yes, I do. But it's not the standard of care. But you should have a good sense of how that bone looks prior to doing any type of implants, and especially immediate implants. Again, you should do a preoperative aesthetic evaluation. Look at the patient's smile line. And in fact, um, you have to get a sense of that patient's uh, own self aesthetic sense, because if this is a particularly picky patient who will be picking up their lip every second of the day looking at that interface, you need to have a very hard discussion with that patient whether or not you may in fact require some peak acrylic at the end of the day. Evaluation of the papilla. Again, if you've had adjacent bone loss, remember that that patient needs to be told that if there's been vertical bone loss because of 
past periodontal disease, there is going to be what's called a black triangle in the abrasia space. It's not due to anything you're doing wrong. It just happens to be due to the lack of adequate bone supporting that papilla. The biotype is very important. Are you dealing with a thick gingiva or a thin gingiva? Knowing and understanding that the thinner the gingiva, the more likely you're going to get gingival marginal recession. And the possibility, in fact, that if your buccal plate is thin and that resorbs a little bit, you're going to have some gray of the implant showing through. So your antenna should be, in fact, sensitized to the biotype, and you may, in fact, need to do some preoperative gingival thickening. Um, hold on a second. I, a little miscue there. Okay, let's go now on to the, the uh, technique. Okay, let's go back. Here we go. Oh, what about the survival of the immediate implants? Um, the literature is clear. Um, and this has been studied multiple times. This happens to be an article out of the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Facial Surgery. Again, they looked at a significant number of three, – they reviewed 301 journals and did a meta-analysis, and they found that the success rate – for immediate implants was 96%, and that's, in fact, uh, the case. Uh, let's go on to, yes. So what should you be evaluating before you do an immediate implant? And this is true for any implant, but specifically implants within the maxillary anterior zone, because that, in fact, is the most common place where you would most likely wish to place an immediate implant. Again, look at the smile line. That's very important. Look at the occlusion. Look at the biotype. And, and you'll notice at the bottom of the slide, which I thought was very interesting, the patient psychiatric profile. I'm not asking you to do a, 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 an intense uh, multi-hour exam, but if you have a sense that this patient is really fixated on the aesthetics, you need to understand that this patient needs to be made clear that there's always a possibility that pink acrylic may be necessary. There's always a possibility that, in fact, this patient may have some aesthetic, and it will. And the size of the the veneer may be not quite the same size. Just be aware that this patient may be much more problematic, and this may not be the patient you wish to do an immediate implant in. Now. The clinical and aesthetic outcomes of implants placed in extraction sockets has been has been well studied. Now, it is clear that the literature does show that there's about a 95% success rate with immediate implants. It is not as high as if you were not to do an immediate implants, clearly. And I tell that to patients. And I say, my success rate with waiting the traditional three to four months or not doing an immediate implant is, in fact, about 99%. And I tell them there's a four to five percent difference. That may not sound like a lot, a lot to some people, but if it happens to that particular patient, it, it is a difference. So I tell patients that in my private office that there is a higher failure rate with immediate, with immediate implants, though one may not consider a five percent failure rate to be significantly high. I allow the patient, of course, to be made aware of that before I place the implants. Now, can and should immediate implants be also be done in molar sites? And that's been studied as well. It was initially most commonly done in the, in the anterior region and thought that molar sites with a large defect would not be a good site for immediate implants. But in fact, that's been studied. And the success rate, and this is a study done that looked at immediate and delayed implants in the maxillary molar region. And as you know, the maxillary molar region is considered type 4 bone. It's the least dense bone. It has the highest failure rates when you do have implants. The most likely implants to fail, immediate failures, would be, and in fact are, in the posterior maxilla. Yet, when 123 implants were studied that were placed immediately into the maxillary molar region, it was found that the success rate for immediate implants was 93.2%.
and the delayed was 94.3. Again, this was not statistically different. So again, another study showing that immediate implants not only work in the anterior region, but in fact do well in the maxilla. This is a study that I've done that of the success rate of immediate implants placed into the mandibular molar area. Again, this was studied and their success rate was 100%. So it's been studied both for the maxilla, it's been studied both for the mandible. The question now is, is when and why should you be doing it? Well, there's certainly advantages. The number one advantage for doing immediate implants is that it reduces the number of surgical procedures. You take the tooth out, you place the implant, it avoids a secondary procedure. And of course, reduction in treatment of time. You'll save three to four months. And of course, the cost may be less. You may package that deal and, and charge less money. And the natural tooth helps you. The socket will help you in, in position that implant. It precludes the need for any type of surgical stent that you may make because you have an actual highway guiding you to the place. And of course, you it's been well studied that there is no bone resorption or the gingival and bony resorption is significantly much less and you get to and because of that you maintain and you support the interdental papilla thus leading to a much more aesthetic outcome well what are some of the disadvantages of course the most critical disadvantage is not having the stability that you normally would get with a implant that you've waited for a good bony healing. So that's always a possibility. Inadequate soft tissue coverage might be another one. But um, the, the disadvantages are one that you have to base on your clinical assessment. If you don't think you can get initial primary stability, for whatever reason, don't place the implant. Now, again, as discussed earlier, the key to doing immediate implants is to have an atraumatic extraction. As we discussed earlier, I like the powered periotome. There are other techniques that people utilize. Some people use the piezo surgery. Some people use a very fine burr. I do the powered periotome, and I have in my hands that works really well. Now, what are the, some of the key surgical tips for placing immediate implants, especially in the anterior aesthetic zone? Well, number one, you want the implant to be, the apical portion of the implant to be at least three millimeters in solid bone. So you want to go beyond the socket, three millimeters. <clears throat> you want to go beyond the socket for three millimeters. And that's something you might want to have some good imaging to see that. So you want to see beyond the socket at least three millimeters. In fact, is there an anatomical place? Or are you right up? Or are you right up against the floor of the nose? Or are you right up against the trabeolar nerve or the mental foramen? If so, that may not be the perfect case for an immediate implant because you want to get that initial stability. So you want to go beyond that three millimeters. You also want to go more palatally on the maxilla. And you want to go 1.5 to 2 millimeters palatal to a line tangential to the labial surface of adjacent teeth. And I'll show you what that means in a second. And you want to place the the implant in two-thirds of the way, place your graft material, and then place it all the way home. So this is an example taken from Dr. Michael Block's book. And you can see there is the socket here. The implant in the maxilla is placed palatally, and it's approximately <clears throat> one and a half to two millimeters labial or palatal to a tangential line from the palatal aspect of the adjacent teeth. Again, this is a nice rendering, artistic rendering, showing how the implant is three millimeters into bone beyond the socket, and that's very important. You could also see how it's palatally this, yes, and there is a gap here, and this is a gap that you will, in fact, be grafting. Now, do you have to graft? There are some studies that show the less than two millimeters that you do not, but I do recommend grafting. Again, an aloe graft or a xenograft, they both work well here. I place the implant two-thirds of the way in, I place my graft, and then I place the implant and I seat the implant home. 
Again, uh, when you're doing the anterior mandible, and I've done immediate implants there, you have to look for the concavity. If there's a concavity, then you should be prepared to use a thinner diameter implant. Now, what about immediate implants and premolars? That's been studied and shown to be effective. The best place to place that would be into the, especially in the first bicuspid region in the palatal root. That would be the best place to place that implant. Now, if you're doing bicuspids in the mandible, again, you must be very cognizant of where the inferior alveolar nerve is because you cannot and should not just place that implant apical to that socket if you are in any way very close to that nerve. The one thing you do not wish to have is to develop a patient with paresthesia. Unfortunately, that's a rising complication in implant placement, and it's soon surpassing uh, a primary cause for lawsuits is paresthesia of the lower lip, tongue, and chin. So secondary to implant placement is becoming a very rising problem. Clearly, you need to be aware of that. Good imaging, good consent, and the patient should be discussed as to this possible complication. So again, this is just showing you the implant place in the bicuspid region. Again, you can see it's more palatally. Again, about 1.5 to 2 millimeters tangential to that line drawn. Now, can you place uh, implants in the maxillary molars, even though it's type 4 bone and have a good success? Well, we talked about that earlier, and its studies have shown that you do. And in fact, it is a viable technique. Now, there are two ways to do that. You can place it into the interradicular bone, but that's sometimes a little bit difficult to do, especially if there isn't much bone, and it requires using a round burr to start the site. It would be much easier and a very good technique with to place it into the palatal root. And most people, in fact, use the palatal root to place their their, their maxillary molar. Again, uh, there are some people who, in fact, would use osteotomes in the interradicular bone. But um, either way, it should be done carefully and making sure that you have the initial stability. If you do the procedure and you do not have initial stability, I would recommend that you abandon the procedure graft and go back because you'd be fooling yourself if you have a, a, an implant that's wobbling around and expect it to integrate. That will be asking too much, I think. Um, again, in the maxillary molar region, it was found that all immediate implants were prepared and placed in the palatal root socket, and they have had uh, actually quite good success. Mandibular molars, again, when you place immediate implants into the mandibular molar region, the same surgical guidelines follow. It should be done atraumatically. Uh, you should be aware of the inferior alveolar nerve canal, and you can, in fact, go through and should go through the interradicular bone using a initial burr and then using osteotomes to widen it. Uh, this is just a case presentation of a mandibular molar atraumatic extraction, making sure that you have good, healthy gingiva. You go direct, to, you're taking 2.2 millimeter implant and then use your osteotomes to dilate the rest, and then you place your implant. Again, this is just showing some people, and there's good literature now, to do not only immediate implants, but immediate temporization with immediate implants. And there's, there is a good body of literature to support that. Again, it's, it starts with an atraumatic extraction. Your implant is placed palatally, 1.5 to 2 millimeters from a line drawn tangentially to the labial aspect of the teeth. The implant is secure three millimeters more apically. The graft is placed, and then you could place your abutment that's been made beforehand into the site, and you could then place your temporary pro, pro temporary restoration. And there's been good literature to support that. And what that does is it really gives you a nice contour to the gingiva, gives you a nice palatal, no gingival recession, and that's a technique that's that's also being done. This is just an interesting thing I want to leave you with. This is a, 
uh, implant and implant dentistry and implant surgery is an exciting field and and every day there's a new technique there's something um, the envelope is being expanded and this is work done of immediate implants but without taking the tooth out literally meaning you take you you decapitate the tooth or you decoronate the tooth you take the crown off you leave the root behind and you drill through the root and if the root in fact as you drill you remove the debris and you place it directly through the site itself this is a series of five patients where they left the roots in fact in place and drilled through it and he had and this author showed a five implants were done not a large study uh, and there was its success for 12, 49 months, what the study was done. Now, this was presented in this month's, uh, this year's American Academy of Osteos Integration. Uh, there was a European gentleman who presented his long study, long study meaning a large study of patients where he does immediate implants through roots. So, in fact, this is the next frontier, and this is a case that I did last week with Dr. Bowler, who I mentioned earlier, the chief resident in our program. As you can see, there was a tooth here that was significantly decayed with the crown, uh, was obviously root decay and obviously a hopeless tooth. The patient, this is a second molar. And what we did was we decapitated the crown, we removed the crown, we decoronated it, we left, and then you can see the residual roots. And here is the starting drill which is 2.2 millimeters or 2.0 depending on the upon the system you use and we're going right through the interradicular root and you can see an x-ray showing we're going through the root itself we are not removing the root we're placing it through the root and then we placed our implant literally through the root uh, we will we are starting to do this based upon the literature that's already out there and we will let you know perhaps in a year or two what our findings are but clearly, immediate implants are, in fact, the technique that has shown the test of time. Uh, the key is you must have an atraumatic accession. You should have good labial bone. You must have primary stability. If you do not, do not place the implant. And uh, there is a significant amount of literature to support that. Well, I hope this has been a, uh, a productive time for you all. Uh, we've gone through a lot of material. Uh, my recommendation is that you continue your implant surgical learning through webinars or textbooks, but certainly implant dentistry is something that general dentists should be aware, should be engaged in, and should be expanding in their practice. Thank you. Uh, for, unfortunately, we have run out of time for questions. Uh, if anyone does have any questions, please go ahead and use the Q&A area to pose any questions that you have, or you can use the chat box, and your questions will be answered via email. I'd like to thank our presenter and our audience for participating in today's webinar. The presentation, recording, and slides will be made available on October 2nd. Please remember to complete the webinar evaluation, which will appear on your screen upon exiting the webinar. Thank you for joining us, and I hope to see everyone at a future webinar.